our household anything to have <coughs> Paul, Melissa's dad, back with us so that he could come visit us. Um, but that's not the reality. But back when he was alive and that he would visit us, when he'd call and give us a warning that they were coming, uh, we'd go into panic mode. It'd be like, as someone said uh, at Greenmount, it'd be red alert. And it was red alert at our house, none, uh, that's for sure. Because when he got there, Paul got there, as the kids call him, he would inspect everything. And he always had a mental checklist for me. And for whatever the reason, I don't know what this meant about him, uh, but his number one item that he would check were light bulbs. And he would go all around the house, making sure all of our light bulbs and never failed. Even if I had changed all the ones that had burned out the night before, it never failed. He'd find at least one uh, that was out. And it would always be the size that I didn't have to replace it. And so that would annoy him even more, is that I didn't have a replacement ready and he'd have to run to Walmart or wherever and get another light bulb. And then he would uh, go and he'd go to where I had the recycling ready to go out. It never failed again. It would always be the night before, the night before trash went out. So two days before trash would go out. And so he would see it all piled up. He'd say, this is terrible. And I said, well, I have a system. And he would just get so frustrated about me saying I had a system, as if I was making it up just to aggravate him. And, uh, but my system was I'd take it uh, down to the outside recycling bin when I took the recycling bin uh, out to the road and brought it back empty. And so it was a cycle, but he did not understand or like that. Then he would go to Asher's room next, and uh, that disgusting mess, that would drive him totally over the wall, to the point where we finally had to tell Paul, just be his granddad, you're, you're his last one left, don't go to his room to inspect it. It was, he was like a military, it was like a military inspection. For this nine or ten year old boy, however Asher was at that time, and uh, anything out of place, uh, I mean, he would just lay in <laughs> to poor little Asher uh, when he got home from school. Um, but that's what we had. Then he would go outside, and you know how um, you can measure tires to see if the tread's right with a penny? Well, he would do that with our grass. And uh, it wouldn't matter if it looked good. It was the actual length of the grass. And he would say uh, whether I passed the test um, or not. But he was so stressed out. Even if they were coming to help, like to help get ready for a new baby. Or if one of us was, whatever, out of commission or away. Um, so they were coming to help. We'd have to spend a week to get ready for them to come help clean our house. Uh, because it was... Just that's the way it was going to be. It was never enough. Uh, all of our work we would do, they'd always find something. Uh, what's interesting, though, is some of that comes from the place that they grew up, and really Melissa's mom, too, in, in, in poverty. And, uh, and so, not that they valued stuff, that wasn't the part of it, was that whatever you did have, they were taught to take care of. And so, to Dave, everything spoke. Everything spoke. And so if he walked into this room and said, well, someone lives here that, and he could fill in the blank. Uh, he'd walk out, if the grass was cut and manicured, he'd say, someone lives in this house that cares. And so that's where it was kind of coming from, that everything inanimate or not, uh, spoke and told a story. And for that, it's probably a pretty good lesson to learn. Uh, this passage that we have from the Gospel according to Luke uh, tells multiple stories as well. Not just the words on the page, uh, but there's plenty of signs and symbols um, in this passage where Jesus is making his way 
uh, preparing to go in to Jerusalem um, for what we now call Holy Week, uh, where he's ultimately going to die for us uh, on the cross. But there's preparations and there's things to be done prior to, and this is the passage that begins this process of getting ready. Um, and so Jesus has his disciples go into town and uh, to get this donkey. Our translation today um, calls it a colt. It's a donkey, young donkey. Um, and so that is how the preparations begin. They bring it out to him. And the story starts to speak to us on multiple levels here. The, the disciples um, tell the person, our master needs it. And when they bring it to Jesus, they throw their clothes on the colt. And so we can imagine they're not just they're, just, they're not just making a saddle, um, but they're preparing, and they're not just preparing, but they're telling us a little bit about who this king is, who is this Jesus. This these clothes that they throw over the donkey uh, tell us a story. The donkey tells us a story. And so this is not going to be any ordinary king, monarch. It's not unusual, it's not unnatural to have a procession into the city of Jerusalem uh, when the kings were bring, being brought in or coming home from battle or, or dignitaries from other places were coming. I mean, processions were um, just like our parades today, an occasion to come out and see what's happening and to see other people and to celebrate uh, what's unusual here is A, that it's a donkey, it's a working animal. And then B, it's not clothed with purple royalty and crowns and gold and, and rich garments. It's clothed with the dirty rags of the disciples who have been walking and gathering with Jesus all along the way. And so it tells us, it speaks to us, it tells us the story of these preparations. And then as they go, they lift up and they put Jesus onto the donkey. And then again further, um, instead of laying out um, you know, a spread for a king, as usual, they throw their clothes, their garments, onto the ground for the donkey to walk across carrying their master, Jesus. Again, it tells us a story. This whole entry, this whole entry tells us a story. It's staged on a donkey. It's a prophetic sign. It's acted out parable. And the gospel, something is always out of place, and this is no different. The final week that we're preparing to hear about here is no different. Things are going to be twisted or flipped upside down. What we expect to come next doesn't, or it's flip-flopped. It's out of place. The neighbor is a Samaritan. The lost sheep is a valued commodity. The prodigal father is God. The rich fool dies. Jesus eats with sinners. And now the king enters the city riding on a borrowed donkey. It's out of place. It's upside down. It's not the natural way. There's something different about this king and this procession. So as the story goes, here's what is the same. The same is controversy follows. And as we've read these stories in the Gospel of Luke leading up to this point, and as we go a little further, this is no different. And that is the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day um, are not happy with the commotion that Jesus is um, stirring. In fact, they're upset at this time with the disciples and they still say to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. And then that's when he gives us this great line. I'll tell you what. Even if they do, the stones will shout out. The stones will shout out. And so Jesus is reminding us that everything speaks. If you or I are silent, everything else will speak around us. And so this is how the story of preparation begins to unfold. We use this passage often um, as we come to the end of the season of Lent. The season of Lent that starts way back at Ash Wednesday and follows us 40 days plus the Sundays. 
we get to this point of Palm Sunday, um, and it takes us through Holy Week leading up to Easter. And historically, uh, from the earliest stages that we have written documents, the season of Lent has been a time of preparation. And the church recognized, and the early apostles and disciples and leaders recognized that you and I need a time of preparation. That it's so much to comprehend and understand even if we are hearing it for the second time or third time or 20th time or 90th time like Lincoln, it's that Easter story is so hard to comprehend the 90th year. Y'all didn't laugh at 90th time. 90th year. I'm to say. So uh, we needed a time of preparation to prepare our hearts, to prepare our hearts for the coming of this Easter story. It's coming of Jesus dying on the cross and then rising again. All the while knowing that even as we have this devoted time to prepare our hearts, that sometimes uh, it's never going to be enough. But nevertheless, we try to prepare our hearts anyway. Jesus, when he goes to the cross, is going to be the most hospitable act in human history. He's going to die for you and I. He's going to bring us into a relationship with God through his death. And for, for whoever of us that believe in that uh, can have eternal life. And so it is through this hospitable act that the most hospitable thing that you and I can do is to prepare and be prepared to receive that message. Our hearts, um, we want to be ready. Now it's the Holy Spirit that readies our hearts and warms our hearts and strengthens our hearts. Uh, but there's some things that we can do to make our hearts more prepared and ready uh, to receive this message of forgiveness. And we know what they are. And you being gathered here and me being gathered here is one of them. Coming to church um, is an opportunity to be with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to hear the music and hear the scripture read, to check in with one another, to pray together, to hear a message, to be charged to go out into the world. That's one of the ways we prepare our hearts, through prayer, uh, at home, or in our cars, or at work, through scripture reading, through serving our neighbor, through being kind to others, to offering forgiveness even to our enemies, to how we respond and think about these world events of of death and destruction and how we process those can help prepare our hearts to be ready for this message all over again of forgiveness or to reject it uh, because our hearts are hardened. Whatever it is, we try to take time and we make preparations for this good news that comes in Jesus the Christ. And sometimes we can get to the point um, where we say, uh, well, no matter what I do, it's never going to be enough. And there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. Um, because the Bible says that God doesn't come into our hearts because we're ready or because we've earned it or because we have done something to uh, deserve it. It's precisely the opposite. If God died for us, sent His Son to die for us, uh, precisely because we don't deserve it and we haven't earned it, uh, but that we need it. And it's by the grace of God. But we still, as the Apostle Paul says, we press on towards that goal of having our hearts ready. And we, and we are ready ourselves to be prepared uh, for this week. And so as we go forward today, um, we press on and try to get our hearts ready for Thursday night and Friday night. And so that when we come back here on Sunday and we see the transformation right in front of us given to us through an image through a metaphor, uh, that ultimately it's our hearts that are ready to hear that message either for the first time or all over again, that our hearts can be transformed. And then in return, and what's beautiful and wonderful about that is as our hearts, our own hearts are transformed and ready for Christ's message to be in us, it can live through us and out of us and we can extend that hospitality to others. And we start making preparations for sharing that love for others. Nothing in this world in terms of peace and war is ever going to be solved until every heart is transformed 
by the grace of God, through knowing Jesus the Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, uh, or Christ returns, whichever comes first. But we press on and we continue to pray for peace. And we pray for our own hearts. And one by one, uh, that transformation takes hold and happens. And we can make our closer circles a better place. And hopefully that expands as we go. Um, day by day, week by week. And in the meantime, we pray uh, for those all around the world as well. That they can hear the grace of God and feel the love of Christ for themselves. And then truly we can be on a path. Uh, to peace that comes through that. So I encourage you this week as you go on your way uh, to continue to make preparations for the coming of the Lord and for the coming of this gospel story that hits us front and center this week um, at the table on Thursday night at the cross on Friday and the empty tomb on Saturday and may the hospitality of God transform our own hearts in order that we can offer that same gift to others their hearts can be transformed too. Amen?